So today's hearing is to further examine legislation introduced by myself and also by Ranking Member Ms. Maloney, entitled Restoring Main Street Investor Protection Confidence Act. I want to begin by directly recognizing and commending the esteemed lady from New York and my colleague for all of her hard work and dedication to this bill and to this issue as well. It has been an honor and it's been a privilege to work closely with her on this very important issue. I also do want to thank the uh, panelists for coming, especially our two victims that have felt the full brunt of the two largest financial frauds in our nation's history. I also want to specifically thank all of my fellow members of the committee and the broader Congress as well that have formally co-sponsored this legislation that we're discussing today. I think right now we are about one quarter of the committee now on the bill, and I hope that number continues to rise as members learn more about this important subject. I also want to express my sincere thanks to uh, Senators uh, David Vitter and Chuck Schumer for introducing companion legislation in the U.S. Senate. Hopefully now with this bicameral support, we will aid us in coming to a more expedited resolution to this problem. Now, I want to make it absolutely clear that I am not advocating for this legislation because I'm trying to score any political points. I'm supporting this legislation because I have studied the law, reviewed past precedent, and analyzed the original congressional intent, and it is very clear to me that CIPIC and the trustees are not applying the law as intended by Congress, and they are not adhering to their own past precedent, which has been affirmed by the courts. And so the purpose of this legislation today is to reaffirm the original intent of the law and to correct the misapplication of the law by CIPIC and the trustee. It is not some retroactive change of the law. It's a reaffirmation of it. CIPIC now argues that it's nothing like FDIC insurance. Yet back in the original, back years ago, President Nixon's original signing statement of CIPA, he said, quote, just as the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation protects the users of banking services from the danger of bank failures, so will the Inve Security Investors Protection Corporation protect the users of investment services from the danger of brokerage firm failure. End quote. In, ca in case that was not convincing enough, I also found this quote during the Senate deliberations of CIPA legislation from its Senate author, that was Edmund Muskie. He said, quote, Mr. President, since 1934, the United States has insured bank deposits under the FDIC and the Federal Savings and Loan Corporation. These insurance programs protect bank depositors from loss of their savings because of bank failures and the existence of this deposit insurance has become a source of confidence in the soundness of our savings institutions. S-2348, the Securities Investor Protection Act of 1970, would accomplish a similar purpose for security investors by protecting them from losses because of the failure of their brokers." End quote. If that wasn't enough, Senator Harrison Williams from New Jersey and then Chairman of the Senate Security Subcommittee stated the legislation, quote, would establish a Federal Brokers Dealers Insurance Corporation Granted, it's not the FDIC, but the FBDIC is pretty darn close to it. I have an email from 2009 from Mr. Harbeck to congressional staff, where in it you directly compared the CIPIC to FDIC, and I would like to later insert that in the record. Mr. Hammerman's testimony, he suggested CIPIC was never intended to cover frauds and says the legislation was, quote, to introduce a new public policy for CIPA and CIPIC, namely insuring investors against the risk of loss due to securities fraud. Quote, yet when going over the reasons for the legislation, Senator Muskie specifically said, quote, there remain some very basic problems within certain parts of the security industry. There are problems of obsolete management techniques, careless business practices, inadequate self-regulation, and occasional fraudulent activities. All of these account, in some part, for the industry's financial difficulties today. And to add further clarification to this topic, the head of the New York Stock Exchange, Robert Heck, wrote to the SEC at the time to provide their analysis of the potential loss to new CIPIC fund. The letter state, quote, I should make it clear, however, that no one can, in our opinion, make a realistic or useful evaluation of the potential dollar exposure to CIPIC because there is no known way to measure the liability which might be faced in the event of a broker deal of failure. The fraud of Allied Crude Vegetable Oil against Ira Huff and Company, for example, caused a loss of some $27 million, which in no way could be anticipated in advance." End quote. And in 1992, the Government Accounting Office, GAO, conducted a report on the operations of the program 
said, quote, within the last six years, 26 of the 39 SIPC liquidations have involved failures due to fraud. They also stated in the report, quote, in essence, SIPC is a backup line of protection to be called upon generally in the event of fraud or breakdown or other regulatory protections. With all that, I struggle to see how we are putting a new public policy objective of fraud protection on SIPC when the record is this long and this clear that protecting investors from fraud was a core function of the original statute and it's been applied that way throughout its existence. Again, turning to Mr. Harbick's testimony, um, he suggests that following a final account statement to determine a customer's net equity somehow legitimizes a Ponzi scheme. Yet SIPC argued for, and the Second Circuit Court agreed, to support using the exact same methodology and the New York Times Securitization Ponzi Scheme resolution in 2004. That New York Times case is very similar, almost identical, to the Madoff case. You see, time and time again, SIPC changes the rules and its story after the fact when it suits its own purposes. The clear truth from a long and exhaustive record makes it clear that SIPC is an insurance program set up by Congress to protect investors and to ensure the appropriate functioning of our nation's securities markets, especially in the case of fraud. So regardless of your views about the original appropriateness of the programs like these, it is our current duty as elected representatives to ensure the law is followed and administered as originally intended by Congress and that investors receive the protection they're promised. The legislation before us designed to improve protections of securities investors particularly the regular retail investor lacking professional expertise in the market. It is a direct outgrowth of a stunning regulatory failure to detect and promptly respond to massive frauds and failures of SEC registered broker dealers, as in the Madoff or the Stanford or now in the McGinn Smith case, which destroyed the principal savings of over 12,000 investors. The devastation of these losses has been compounded by the failure of SIPC to fulfill its obligation as intended by Congress back in 1970. And so the provisions are common sense reform in the bill, specifically to do these things. One, remove the inconsistencies in the application of SIPC coverage, which has led to greater confusion. Two, to assure the SIPC protective benefits goes to innocent customers. Three, limit the exposure of taxpayers by establish new accountability measures for SIPC's borrowing authority. And four, Avoid over-technical legal interpretation at odds with SIPA's re remedial objectives and the original spirit and intent of the law. Five, improve the fiduciary character of SIPA liquidations. And six, strengthen the SEC's plenary oversight of SIPA. And finally, direct SEC and FINRA to give high priority to inspection procedures which verify and validate the accuracy and authenticity of information provided by broker-dealers to their customers. See, all these proposed amendments seek to assure the SIPA is administered with constant attention to the perspective and the reasonable expectations of the broker-dealer customers, those whose confidence is marked participation SIPA is intended to engender and maintain. Now, a point too often overlooked is that SIPA, while using many of the established practices of the bankruptcy code, is, though, unconditionally an amendment to the federal securities law meant to strengthen the efficient operation of the capital markets by maintaining the confidence of the retail user. It's a backbone of the system. Accordingly, the bill seeks for the future administration of SIPA to clarify the securities law primarily shall have the operation uh, operative recognition. Now, Mr. Harbeck, you, in your written statement this morning, further emboldened me in my determination to put SIPA back on the right course in carrying out SIPA's grand objective of deploying its resources to help the financially devastated and innocent and unsophisticated victims of broker-dealers in bankruptcy, including fraud, so, such as those who are with us this morning, rather than lawyering up to see how narrowly it can interpret the law's remedial objectives. It is your basically complete confidence in civic in performing as the Congress 1970 intended that troubles me. I don't doubt for a second that you believe with genuine conviction that civic actions are absolutely correct, not only with SIPA's letter, but the spirit of the law. And I don't question your integrity for a moment. But I'm deeply disturbed by your satisfaction with SIPA's performance in these massive fraud cases, which have, thankfully, captured the attention of Congress now with profound concern. 
Our bill seeks to reaffirm the original intent of Congress in the enactment of SIPA to make reforms in its administration for the future, and above all else, to change the culture of SIPA to one that seeks to fulfill and not hinder SIPA's remedial purposes. I close by saying I'm thankful to a lot of people today. At the beginning, I said so at the beginning of my statement, but with all the victims and their family still reeling from the frauds, you must say that this is not a thankful day. But I will be thankful once SIPIC is reformed and the original intent of Congress is reaffirmed.